Welcome to the third edition of our Meet Our Leaders series. Um, this is a series organized by the SCG Academy, which was launched earlier this year. Um, the SCG Academy um, develops and makes available top educational content on sustainable development. Our mission is to, is to build a global community, to build a global knowledge for achieving the sustainable development goals, to cross dis disciplinary boundaries and to bring practice um, into the classroom. The SDG Academy is hosted by the Sustainable Development Solutions Network. My name is Guido Schmidt-Traub. I'm the Executive Director of the, of, the, of, the, of the Sustainable Solutions Network, the SDSN, and I'll be moderating the session. We're extremely fortunate to have Dr. Maria Ferry with us today, but before I introduce our, our speaker today, I would just like to hand over to our wonderful partner, the UN System Staff College and Chico Caruso, we will introduce the platform and say a few words um, about the UN staff, about the UN System Staff College. Hugo, over to you. Thank you very much, Guido, and welcome everyone. Delighted, as Guido said, to support the, the delivery of the today's webinar. Just a very uh, few um, quick and ground rules on how to um, interact with the speakers and how to use the WebEx platform. Uh, just the very first things, please keep your, your mic on mute. Here you can see, if you follow the arrow, there is the mic icon next to your name. Now it is on red, so please keep it mute, though this will avoid background noises coming uh, through the presentations. The other issues on how to interact and how to uh, advance your question, please use the chat panel and make sure you select all participants in the, uh, in the same team name. It's, um, now, with any further ado, let me hand over to Dido. Just a final remark. It's the webinar is being recorded. The recording of the webinar will be shared uh, through the SDG Academy uh, later uh, today. Thank you and, and enjoy the webinar. Thank you very much, Hugo. And just a few words about the purpose of the session. The aim of the Meet Our Leaders series is to, is to really get a first-hand account of what it is like to be to be in the trenches leading on some of the major transformations that we've seen on sustainable development. Dr. Maria Ferro will share with us some of her experiences um, in the public health field and biomedical research. And um, she has an she has an incredibly broad um, and um, and, uh, and long background in this field. And we would like to make this session therefore as interactive as possible. So as Hugo said, please do prepare your questions. We'd love to give you the floor so, so that you can interact directly with Dr. Maria Frey. So let me let me turn to Dr. Maria Frey. She is the president and, and executive director of the foundation of the National Institutes um, of Health, um, uh, a foundation that mobilizes um, funding for research and clinical trials on a broad range of public health and biomedical challenges. Um, she has a long illustrious career. She was previously president of the Albert Maria Lasky um, Foundation the CEO and president of the Global Alliance for Sabine Drug Development, um, and headed up the Office of Technology Transfer at the National Institute of Health. Maria also has, um, has a very interesting personal journey. She was born and raised in, uh, in Peru, where she started her university career and then came to the United States for, um, for a PhD. So not only in terms of her, her, of her professional experience, but also a personal outlook, she is a real international leader. Um, Maria, I wanted to maybe just um, just start off with um, with you to, asking you to share, maybe just a few, just just describe briefly um, your experience, the types of challenges uh, you've worked on, and um, and maybe some of the some of uh, some of the salient lessons that you've taken um, from your from your work to date. Hello, Guido. It's great to be here, and hello everybody from all over the world. I'm delighted to be here and honored, in fact, to be here. Um, as Guido said, I've had great opportunities in my life and many of those come with great challenges. But um, I guess I need to start by, uh, as Guido said, recognizing the fact that I was born and raised in Lima, Peru. Uh, my parents are still there. I visit frequently. And so when um, you look to tackle issues, you somehow always go back to where you came from. And I realized that as I was getting my PhD in biophysics, as interesting as that journey was, um, I needed to work in pro um, programs and projects that brought the science to fruition. In other words, it wasn't only 
enough for me to be able to do very good, solid, basic science, but I wanted to see the result at the end of the day. And for those of you who are in biomedical sciences, you know that it takes a very long time from the moment you start doing the basic biology of disease to figuring out what that information means overall for you and for society. So I decided to leave the laboratory after I had done my PhD in membrane biophysics. I went and did my first postdoctoral studies in immunology, my second postdoctoral studies in virology and herpes, as a matter of fact. And um, I had an opportunity, quite by serendipity, to apply for a position that would take me to the U.S. Congress. Now, this was quite interesting because, of course, coming from Peru, having gotten my Ph.D., having done my work as a, as a bench scientist, all of a sudden I said, I wonder what it's like to do some policy and how, how does policy work? How, how do all these rules come about? How do we fund science? How do priorities get set? And so I applied for a fellowship, and to my great surprise, I got it, to work in the U.S. Congress and the House of Representatives uh, for one year, and it got extended to work on the Senate side of the U.S. Congress for a second year. And I learned an enormous amount. And one of the things I learned is that the intersection between policy and science is a very important place to be. So on the one hand, you have to ensure that you have the resources to support the basic understanding that will lead to transformative changes in medicine, in my case. But on the other, you need the society to be behind that enterprise. So it was a very interesting part of my life. I then went back to the university, and I got challenged by the notion, I had worked on a piece of legislation on Capitol Hill that allowed people to patent the inventions that came out of the laboratory. And that was not done at the time. And I thought, you know, it would be interesting to figure out how, in fact, you come from a finding in basic biology to having a product. And I became one of the first people that was doing what was then called and is still known as technology transfer. But I was doing technology transfer, and for me it was important to do it not only and primarily for profit, but to ensure that the technologies that we worked on were technologies that in fact were important for society. And in fact, I could transfer. I became head of the Office of Technology Transfer at the National Institutes of Health, which had policy um, oversight for all of the research funded by the National Institutes of Health of the U.S., which is the largest in the world. But what I came to realize is that while we were able to transfer technology for cancer, or we were able to transfer technology for diseases like diabetes or central nervous system, it was very, very hard to transfer technology for indications that affected primarily poor populations. And that took me to be the head of an organization, it started with three people that worked on the development of new tuberculosis drugs. Now it's the largest group in the world, it's a non-for-profit group that works in developing the medicines for tuberculosis, but when the opportunity was presented to me, I realized tuberculosis is a very important disease for people in Peru. In fact, multidrug resistance and, um, and XDR are certainly problems in my country of birth. And so that part of my life, I realized that what I could do is bring my scientific expertise, the policy expertise, and what really moved and triggered my interest and put it all together and move forward. So I've been very lucky, Guido, to be able to do that here. I was able to recognize great science when I was at the Lasker Foundation. And now here at the Foundation for the National Institutes of Health, we do the same. It's bringing different groups and different people to tackle a problem so that we can create an inflection, so that we can change the path and do things that are going to have important effect in the world. Maria, this is um, 
this is fascinating. It's a great story. And I wanted to just um, um, pick up on some questions that some of our um, viewers and listeners have, have, have posed, namely this broad issue, which you've already hinted on, Maria, is how can you make biomedicine more affordable and better available in low-income countries? And how can we make sure that the phenomenal pro progress that we're seeing in science and technology um, really also benefits people who, who don't have the means to pay uh, market rates for their drugs. And, and TB being, of course, quintessentially also a disease of the poor, not just poor, not, not only poor country, but also poor populations. I, want, I was wondering if you could share, just, just share some more lights on how that worked. What were some of the issues that you encountered when you started working on TB and how were those addressed? So let's start with the, the issue of access to medicines is a very important issue, Guido, and I just finished being on a panel convened by Ban Ki-moon, the UN Secretary General, to have a report on essentially this um, imbalance or, or this tension between the need to access medicines, the cost of medicine, and the populations that need them. So let me put that aside for a moment, and I'm happy to address it. I've spent the last nine months of my life working on that. But I want to talk about the tuberculosis example, which is a particularly interesting example. This was in the early 2000s, 2001 to be exact, where the world came together in a remarkable way. The first thing that happened is the, the human genome had been sequenced. Now, why is that important? It is important because after the human genome was sequenced, we had the capability to sequence all sorts of other organisms like bacteria and viruses and uh, other genomes of, of other mammals of, of all sorts of, of different organisms. And for the first time, we were able to really understand the genetic makeup and the sequence of the, the tuberculosis bacillus. With that, we were also for the first time really able to start figuring out where the targets for drug intervention could be. So is it the cell membrane? Is it the bacteria itself? What part of the bacteria where we want to attack, where we want to do the drug? So the science was moving forward. The second thing that was happening, I know for your audience, which is probably much, much younger, um, this will be a, come as a surprise, but at the time, people didn't have phones all over the world, and at the time, communications were just starting to explode, and for the first time, we were able to see what was happening with AIDS in Africa, and we were able to see what was happening with malaria, and we were able to see what was happening with tuberculosis, and so the world had come together around uh, AIDS, TB, and malaria created the Global Fund. We could see very clearly using telecommunications the suffering that was happening around the world and the need that was there. And then finally, we had governments. The economic situation was different. The government had money. Um, there were philanthropic organizations. The Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation was interested in putting money into this space. And so this triumvirate of this confl confluence of factors became a moving and important critical element. So organizations that brought together the public sector, the private sector, and governments were, were created, and the TB Alliance was one such organization. We started with three people. We had a mandate to develop new medicine for tuberculosis. We had a little bit of funding from the Rockefeller Foundation, and uh, we got additional funding from the Gates Foundation. And we essentially started by looking to see what was there. And to our great surprise, Guido, we didn't find very much. The idea was that there was going to be all this antibiotic sitting on the shelves, and that we could just pluck it and move it. And that wasn't, that wasn't true. We could find a few gems. But over the next few years, we started developing a portfolio. We started investing in the compounds. And we also realized that it wasn't about developing one drug. We really had to develop a combination drug because otherwise you create resistance. So that's the story. And right now, it's uh, doing great. There are trials 
uh, at phase three, which is the last uh, part of the clinical trial chain. And we hope to have, and I hope they will have uh, a new um, regimen for tuberculosis pretty soon. Maria, I forgot to give credit to, two, to the two listeners whose question I, I just used. It was, of course, Hector Bautista and Ibrahima Dumbia, so apologies for not doing that when I posed the question. I wanted to just um, follow up on what you've described. You've, you've laid out a really compelling story of tremendous scientific progress. There was a confluence of major discoveries that were not initially linked to TB, the genome project, um, that, that then opened, opened new doors. But I'm wondering if, it, if, if there wasn't also, if there wasn't more to that than quote unquote just good science and just making better tools available because I'm old enough to remember that in the early 2000s and late 1990s, health just seemed like it was a very difficult field. Those were the days when HIV AIDS was out of control. Um, nobody was seriously talking even, even about HIV AIDS treatment in, in poor countries. So there was a widespread sense that literally we just had to let these people die. Um, malaria incidence was rising, um, uh, and, and TB incidence was also rising. Um, we didn't have good treatment regimes against multidrug resistant TB, and there was a general sense that this just wouldn't happen, it wasn't possible, and yes, there might be scientific breakthroughs. And then if we fast forward to today, um, we're now talking about eradicating those diseases. Now, that may or may not be possible, particularly with TB, that's of course, not, maybe, maybe you can say a word about that as well. But the transformation is just is just is just remarkable, and I, wonder, I was wondering what else were the were the ingredients that you saw, uh, maybe even beyond the immediate realm of your of your activities. Well, um, it's very good point and very important point, and we go back to this issue of um, society and the role society plays in part of of transforming the landscape. Um, I give a lot of credit, for example, and I will take I will tick the other elements that I um, that I think were important. But I give a lot of credit to the patients, the AIDS activists. It was the the very first movement there that really galvanized action for us to say this is no longer acceptable. The deaths of malaria, the incidence of tuberculosis, and the number of millions of people that were infected with HIV AIDS, that it was just simply not acceptable to sit down and wait for people to die. Something had to happen. And there were, for those of us who are old enough to remember, there were enormous demonstrations on the streets all over the world saying this was just not an acceptable status quo. And then, of course, under uh, Brundtland, I believe, during uh, her tenure at WHO, there was the study. That's, in the, that, that's the World Health Organization. Just yeah, um, the, sorry, the World Health Organization. Um, uh, under the, <clears throat> under the, the um, um, leadership of Jeff, Jeff Sachs, there was a very important macroeconomic study that analyzed the impact of these diseases on the world economy. So health as an economic driver and as an economic um, pull for society and how that link was made to poverty, which resulted not only in the Global Fund for AIDS, TB, and Malaria, but of course for the first generation of the, what we called at the time the Millennium Development Goals. So we saw a confluence of political action, political will, um, empowerment of the people who were the activists, and empowerment of and, and the commitment of the governments themselves to do something, that this was just not an acceptable situation. So um, yes, science was critically important, and the investment on science allowed us to leapfrog and to provide some of the solutions, but without political will and without having this agenda put forth very clearly in front of us, I think uh, the world would be a very different place today. What can we learn from this, Maria, for other medical cha public health challenges and um, even disasters? We've just, uh, well, two, two short years ago, we lived through the disaster of Ebola in West Africa. Yeah. Is this something that we will see more of? Um, is, this, is the likelihood of such um, pandemics rising? 
And what can be done to to prevent them and to and to address them much more quickly than we did? Because just for our listeners, I mean, just to remind ourselves, this is a period when, over the course of many many months, some countries were just completely shut down. The economies were completely shut and had an absolutely devastating impact, not just in terms of lives lost, but also in terms of economic opportunities lost. Well, so you realize, and I think the people listening um, will will understand and appreciate that what my career has been about is in making the tools available, the, the health technologies available for people to use. But that's just one part of the equation. We talked a minute ago about political will and about empowerment and about the commitment that needs to happen, both from the public sector as well as the private sector, by the way. But there's more to, to the story. And unfortunately, Ebola was a case that illustrated it very clearly. So first and foremost is the issue of health systems. We are far from where we need to be in providing basic health infrastructure for people around the world. Some groups, some locations are much better off than others. But in the case of pandemics, in the case of the flu, in the case of these diseases, part of the problem is you don't have the local infrastructure necessary in order to contain the, the pandemic and to ensure that, it, that it, um, it doesn't extend. So the ability for us to be aware, MSF played a critically important role in the case of Ebola. They were highlighting and heightening the, the, um, the, that this was happening. And frankly, the world in general and society in general was a little bit asleep in, at, at the wheel. Now, the problem also arises when these uh, pandemics happen for which we have no tools. So we found ourselves in the case of Ebola without any vaccine, without any drugs, and without any fast diagnostic uh, tools that would allow us to identify what it was and to attack it immediately. The problem is, and, and this is a societal level problem, how do you prepare for the next pandemic? You asked me if there will be a next pandemic, and yes, there will be one. Um, how will we prepare to ensure that when that happens, we minimize the deaths, we minimize the impact on society, we minimize the economic problem? We cannot, we, we have a list, the World Health Organization has a list, uh, the National Institutes of Health has a list, the Wellcome Trust has a list of what we think are going to be the potential pandemics and where we think the risk is heightened. The problem is that developing tools, and by tools I mean diagnostic vaccines and therapeutics, for every one of those indications is a mammoth investment and it's a great effort. And it takes a lot of money and it takes a lot of scientific acumen. So one of the proposals that um, has been put forth is that we develop, for example, uh, medicines for a lot of these diseases that are on this list, but don't develop them completely. Develop them to a point where they can be activated very quickly if and when a pandemic hits. So for those of you who don't know anything about drug development, I'll be very simplistic in telling you that you start by identifying a potential compound. You then test that compound in the laboratory in a petri dish. If that seems to kill, in the case, let's say it's an infectious agent, then you do additional research and you make sure that there are no nefarious effects before you put that in a human being. And you first put it in humans that don't have that disease because you want to prove that it's safe. The most important thing when you develop medicines is that they're safe. You don't want to create a problem when you're trying to solve another. So when the, that phase one clinical trial is positive, in other words, there is no adverse effect, then you do a second trial. The first one is usually between 10 and 20 people. You do a second trial with people that do have the disease. And this is close to 30 or 40 people. That is the test that that compound is effective. So now you've, the first trial tells you it's safe. The second trial will tell you if, in fact, will work. And if it doesn't work, 
then you have to start and go back to the drawing board. If it works and it seems to be safe and it seems to be effective, then you go to a larger trial, which is a phase three trial. Why am I explaining all of this to you? And a phase three trial has a thousand people, or depending on the indication. But I'm telling you this because between the time you have a molecule to the time where you have a phase three drug, it could be 10 years, it could be 15 years. Well, if you're in the middle of an Ebola crisis, you don't have 10 years, you don't have 15 years in order to produce a medicine or a vaccine. Um, the vaccine is slightly different, but the same principle uh, to, to, to go to the field. So the idea would be for us to have an armamentarium of, of medical technologies that will get, let's say, past that phase two. So we know it's safe and we know it's effective and we can go from there to do a very quick um, activation of that platform to move into a phase three. So Guido, this is a very expensive proposition. It's not simple to do. We certainly don't have a crystal ball. We, we can statistically say where we think the next pandemic or the next epidemic will happen, but we don't know. So as a society, it's, somebody made the analogy of um, having a fire station. You, you have fire stations because in the event that you have a fire, you want to make sure you can take care of it. No, uh, we don't want to have uh, a situation where we're unprepared. And in the case of many of these pandemics and these diseases, we are unprepared. Now, we also, so that's one box, the, the box of what happens in the case of a pandemic or in the case where, where something unexpected happens. We do have chronic diseases that we know are there and we know we have to take care of. Uh, cancer and um, heart disease and diabetes, etc. And these diseases are now becoming not only diseases of uh, high income countries, they are becoming diseases of society and we have um, problems which uh, some people call um, the, the double burden of disease. So we have the infectious disease and now we have the chronic disease on top of us. So we have to develop strategies for these chronic diseases. And then, of course, we have diseases like TB, malaria, Chagas, et cetera, that are um, very big diseases with large impact in society for which we have to develop uh, technology. So in order for us to be prepared, in order for us to ensure that we have the tools we need, prevention, vaccines, vaccination is critically important. In order for us to um, be able to develop, it's not only good enough to develop the medicines, but if we don't happen to have the infrastructure, if we cannot afford the cost of the medicine, that will be a real problem because then we're doing this for naught. Uh, Maria, on this um, on this specific point, um, we have a question that's just come in from um, Shitesri Devi. Uh, she's asking if if there is if there is a correlation that's been established between minimizing the the incidence and prevalence of chronic diseases and the the likelihood or the danger of widespread widespread pandemics. In other words, to what extent is beyond the actual health systems which you've described also the, the health of the population, yeah. a major factor that we should be concerned about. Absolutely. Um, it, you know, she's absolutely right in asking the question. And there is, of course, a very clear correlation when the immune system is down for whatever reason. I mean, you could have uh, a cancer or you can have another kind of disease. Clearly, that has a, or malnutrition. We don't even have to go to disease. We can go to a population that's malnourished or or has um, those kinds of problems. That that has an enormous and direct impact on on the on the our ability to tackle these um, endemic problems. So she's very astute and she's absolutely right about that. Right. We have a number of very specific questions on specific medical challenges, which I want to come to, but I do want to stay on some of these broader. Um, I can't hear you very well, Guido. Can you speak a little louder? I'm sorry. Yeah, can I can hear you now. Hear now? So we have a we have a number of, of very targeted questions that I come to on specific medical questions that I'll ask you in a bit. But I wanted to stay on some of these broader um, questions first, and also um, just explain to our listeners that there's there, there have been a number of questions on climate change 
um, which Dr. Perry is not an expert in. Um, and we will, we, we will be able to take those up in a future Meet the Leader session when we, when we will be focusing on climate change. So Maria, I will, you've... I will say about climate change, though, that um, very much like the previous question, climate change does have an effect on the, the, the health of, of um, society and, and of particular areas, geographic areas. I mean, global warming and malaria, for example, is a correlation that has been well established. But I think others need to take that challenge better, better than us. Right, yeah. right. Um, you've, you've explained how, how expensive it is to, to develop a drug and how long it takes. This is a very risky proposition. We're living at times when where public budgets are under enormous pressure, not just in rich countries, but also in emerging economies. Um, where there's an increasing, increasing short-termism, and so many people are now referring to the private sector um, as, the, as, the, as the actor that really should take these things forward. And now, in your career, you've, you've really covered the full spectrum from working on almost fully commercial um, drug development issues um, in the United States to sort of orphan issues, issues that really required almost entirely public financing. And so I just wanted to ask you if you could give us, share, share your sense of um, the role the private sector can or to play, where can and should they do more? What are maybe, are there any limitations to what the private sector can, can do? And what are some of the interesting public, public private partnership models that you're seeing? And I, and I know that your foundation is also working on some of these issues. Yes, thank you. Um, indeed, the, the public sector and the private sector, um, as well as individuals, have a very important role. So let me focus right now on what the public sector has done and, and can do. There is no question that in every realm there are good actors and that there are bad actors. And, and I'm not about to make excuses for bad actors in, in any realm. And, and what do I mean by that? We've seen uh, lately in the United States, for example, medicines that are generic, that because the market could bear it have been doubled or tripled or, or, or increased in price. So the issue of pricing, by the way, is not only uh, a problem in uh, poorer countries. I think it's a problem that society is going to have to address directly. The, when I worked on the tuberculosis drug development, what we realized is that there is an enormous amount of wealth of knowledge and information on how to develop drugs. They have a lot of compounds. They've tested these compounds. And our ability to access those co compounds and to access those libraries and to access that information tremendously helped our work. What I found was that even for us in the non-for-profit sector, we were able to work with the public, with the private sector on agreements that allowed us to do just that. So we had, for example, one of the most promising compounds that, that I brought into the alliance. And I said I did because I literally was the one that had to go and negotiate the agreements. We were so small, we would do everything from washing the, 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 the dishes for lunch to, uh, to negotiating these agreements came from a small company called Pathogenesis. And Pathogenesis was a small company in, in the United States. It's a small biotech that then got bought by a bigger company called Chiron at the time. And we negotiated the deal with Chiron. Of course, we didn't have money to, to, to come up with great licenses and great payments for any of this. And it was very interesting to be able to negotiate with the company in order for us to have an indication for tuberculosis. This was not something that they were going to do themselves. This was not a profit-making enterprise. But yet they understood that they, in fact, had a very important compound that could contribute to the good of society. So one of the key, uh, key activities that companies can and should and do undertake is to try and make these compounds and technologies available for the indications for which they may not have any interest in developing further. Um, there are other indications that um, are it for markets where there will be profit. And I think that 
the, that is a discussion that also needs to happen, how to ensure that those compounds and those drugs are available for the people who need them worldwide. So at the technical level, at the policy level, at the, at the um, economic level, I think the, the private sector not only has a role, but indeed an obligation to, to move this forward. Great. Let's, um, with your permission, let's turn to some of the specific um, questions that have come up on a um, on number of public health issues. Um, Claudia from Mexico asks about um, the challenges of heavy metal poisoning. Um, she's working in a community where people are um, uh, have got kidney, kidney disorders because of heavy metal poisoning of a nearby lake. Um, this is also um, a major issue, of course, in many parts of Bangladesh. Um, and so I was wondering, are there any, what is the, do we have, do we have strategies for, for dealing with these issues? Are there, are there, are there new tools that are in preparation? Are there new strategies for, um, for better diagnosing, preventing them, and then also treating the, um, the, uh, the, the, the effects of, um, of exposure? Guido, this is not my area of expertise, but I will tell you, I'll give you a small vignette. When I was working, I explained earlier that in, early in my career, I did technology transfer. And one of the, the first technology that I ever transferred was, in fact, a, detect, a detection agent for lead in water sources. And uh, so that it could be identified, it could be, um, it, it could be uh, quantitated. To, to be able to work on uh, chelating agents and, and other preventive agents. It's a huge problem. It's not only a problem in Mexico, it's a problem in the Amazon. It's, it produces all sorts of, of, um, of uh, problems. I, this is not my area, so I can't tell you what the state of the art is, but that allows me to talk about something else that I am passionate about, um, if you don't mind me taking a digression here. Of One of the areas, and, and you know this well, for when we were working on the, uh, on the Sustainable Development Goals, is mental health. We've spoken about um, the AIDS, TB, malaria, dengue, Ebola, you know, now uh, poisoning by, by um, contamination. One of the big areas that we don't discuss is mental illness. And as far as I'm concerned, that's a huge loss for us. We have to, have to work on proactive measures on the mental illness. We know very little about the brain. We ver know very little about brain processes. But it's not only about the physical health, it is also about mental health. So um, I bring this up because, of course, a lot of, um, of these heavy metals are associated with this, this kind of disease. But um, everything from Alzheimer's to bipolar <laughs> disorder to depression um, to the different kinds of dementia are something that we need to, need to address with as much urgency as we need to address the infectious diseases from my perspective. Maria, we have another question on this, on this topic of mental um, illnesses from Mahmoud J.K. Yazdanus. Um, he asks, to what extent biomedical sciences can improve psychological resilience in the face of massive inequalities, economic disadvantage, and highly adverse social conditions? So let me maybe broaden that question. There's been a lot of talk and research about the, the impact that um, uh, inequalities can have on, um, on mental well-being and, uh, and mental health. So I wanted to get your, your take on that and to what extent this, for example, there was a famous book called The Spirit Level written by some epidemiologists in the UK. Um, is this something that, that, that you come across in your work? And do you have a view on how serious this, 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 this is as an issue? And is this something that biomedical science can, uh, can tackle? Uh, Guido, help me with a with a question because I lost you there for a minute. You were talking Sorry. about the 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 impact of the psychological well being on the physical well. I, I'm I didn't quite get. Sorry, it. Sorry. it's a two part question. One is to what extent do social inequalities affect people's mental health and mental well being? So to what extent can can somebody suffer 
medical problems as a result of inequalities. Um, and then the second part of that question is: is this is this an issue that you are seeing um, in your in your work? Is this something that people are working on from a from a, from, a, from a biomedical perspective in order to find solutions? Um, there is there is correlation, of course, to the first to the first question. Yes, there is correlation between the physical well-being and the mental well-being. There's there's no in my book. There's no question about that. And uh, inequality certainly does um, create bigger problems for society in terms of um, mental health and mental illness. In in two ways. One, the individual itself, but two, because those generally those groups are not well attended and don't have the preventive measures that we now know exist. So we have some tools that we can use to help people that have mental illness, but they're not broadly um, applied simply because of the inequality. There, there's no access to that particular level of therapy, either um, physical therapy, um, um, by that I mean, you know, drugs or medicines, but also simply basic psychological and, and psychiatric support. So there is no question that that inequality plays a big, big role. And w, the World Health Organization has in fact recognized this as a very important uh, and dramatic increase in the world that needs to be addressed. It's considered a big health emergency. The second part of the question is, have I come across it in my work? We do a lot of work in uh, the, the mental illness space at the Foundation for the NIH. Uh, probably not exactly in the same uh, way that you're asking the question, but I will tell you, for example, we do a lot of work in trying to understand the basic biology of Alzheimer's in trying to understand the longitudinal effects of some of these deteriorating uh, diseases. And we've gotten a new program on the development, on the uh, connectome, the early development uh, of the human brain. So we're tackling these issues from the basic science. You see, I'm a firm believer that if you don't have a basic understanding of the biology of disease, you can try all sorts of, of medicines and, and they won't work. And by the way, um, by I don't mean to be chauvinistic in my expression of um, the importance of drugs or vaccines or diagnostics in, in Western medicine. I happen to believe that there's an enormous amount of wealth in traditional medicine from which we can extract uh, information and from which we can extract knowledge. And we've not done a very good job at understanding some of that traditional knowledge and some of the learnings of thousands of years. In fact, if you go back now to malaria, the the uh, the way to you you uh, was able to extract the the active compound of artisanin was to go back five thousand years into Chinese medicine and look for how the the Chinese treated that. And she very cleverly figured out that you couldn't do it by heat extraction. You had to do it by cold extraction. And that's what changed the world. Uh, and it provided us with the first true um, good uh, medicine for malaria. So uh, I know I've been talking about drug development in the Western context, but I'm not wanting to be exclusive of that. Maria, this is a perfect segue for two two questions that have just come in that I would like to just pose together. One is from Mansi. She asks what your views are on generic drugs being developed um, uh, and distributed in um, in countries against the wishes of others. Um, and then there's a second question specifically on the issue of malaria. And Rika Cardona would like to know how we're going to win the race. Um, in against um, mosquito resistance, against um, chemicals for uh, exterminating mosquitoes, but then also, of course, in uh, against um, the um, against resistance of the parasite against uh, against drugs. Oh my! Other than that, do you have another hour? To <laughs> <laughs> I thought I'd, I'd, I'd snag these, these easy questions in at the end. No, 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 not not easy questions. So. 
Um, tell me a little bit more about the generic question. What, what do they mean about the, against the wishes of, of others? I guess I didn't understand that. Are we saying that, um, if, please, uh, I'm happy to, to make up a question, but I want to make sure I... No, I guess, I, guess, I guess the broader issue is what role do generics play? Um, is it um, some Western manufacturers are not happy that their drugs can be produced um, by uh, generic producers in, uh, in other countries outside the usual licensing agreements. Is this something that is necessary um, or is this something that, um, that we should work to curtail? I think that, uh, you know, the, the patent system provides for monopoly and protection dur during a certain period of time. When that period of time is done, I think it is critically important and the responsible thing to do to make sure that generics uh, penetrate the market. Um, there are, under the TRIPS agreement, uh, for those of you who are aware of that, provisions whereby countries can um, produce drugs under compulsory licensing, even if the manufacturer doesn't want to do a, a regular or cannot negotiate a, a regular license. And if it's the health of, of the people. I think the society has responsible, the governments have a responsibility to protect their people. So there is a mechanism to do this and I think countries should do whatever they need to do to protect the health of their people. With respect to what to do about resistance and what to do about um, uh, the, the, I guess the question is about vectors of disease and how what do we do about mosquitoes, and how do we um, prevent mosquitoes from being the vectors? Is that the is that the right? Question? Right. Well, um, I've given a lot of thought, and we do a lot of work in this space because clearly um, malaria, dengue, and Zika now are transmitted by by the Aedes aegypti. This has to do with a population of mosquitoes, and therefore reducing the population of mosquitoes will curtail some of these diseases, or we know is going to reduce the incidence of disease. We can do that by spraying, which probably is the brute force approach, which certainly have happened um, now with Zika. We can do so by introducing Wolbachia, which is a naturally occurring organism into the mosquito, which renders the male of the species less able to procreate and therefore reduces the species. And now there's new technology called CRISPR-Cas9 that allows us to go in and um, edit the, the, the genome of the mosquito to also curtail the, the population. So there are many tools. In putting these tools into practice, we also have a responsibility to see what the environmental impact, what the ethical impact, what the community uh, information has to be, the knowledge of the people where these technologies are going to be um, used. And that's not trivial, and it's critically important for all of us to ensure. And so we work here at the Foundation uh, of, at NIH, we work very, very closely and very carefully with the people in the field, in the, in the different populations, with the community leadership to see what, if any, of these technologies are appropriate and available and um, are the right technology to, to deploy, to curtail some of these diseases. We have a particularly robust program in dengue that turns out to be uh, important for, for Zika as well. So we're deeply involved in making sure that the infrastructure and the responsibility that we have to take as uh, scientists in, in doing this is up front and center in whatever we do. Maria, fascinating. If you don't mind, I would like to use the last few minutes of this conversation to talk, to come back to the person of Maria Prairie and to, and to get your thoughts on leadership and any advice that you might have for, for young scientists, um, future social sustainable development leaders. Your career is, is, is an exemplar of working on many, many different fields. There's, there's a clear red thread that, that, that cuts through it, but 
Um, uh, I would imagine that you that you couldn't have imagined the kinds of challenges you're working on today, just 10 or 20 years ago. And I was just wondering, you know, if you if you reflect back on that, and um, you know, when when people ask you for advice or when you when you hire new future leaders, what is it you look out for, and what is it that beyond, of course, the the technical excellence that one must have, um, what are the other qualities, experiences that you think equip one well to um, to have um, to have impact and to have a successful and fun career. Well, thank you, Guido. I hope I've had impact, and I hope my impact is yet to come. I hate to think that at this stage of my career, I won't find more fun and interesting things to do. Oh, then, we're not letting you off the hook, Maria. <laughs> <laughs> so, the, well, thank you for that. Um, you know, when you're starting out in your career, you you have to try many things. And uh, it's been said before, and I'm not going to be very original in, in telling people what I'm about to say, but look, it's hard to do something uh, that will hopefully be impactful. It's hard to do things well. So you might as well do something that you love doing. Because if you don't love what you are doing, then it's going to be doubly hard. So. Um, when people ask me how I made my decisions, and if you look back in my career, it's sort of a checkered past, I will have to say. And it didn't make any sense, it doesn't make any sense, until you look at it from, from, uh, from, a, ba from a back, and then you say, oh, okay, so it, it's, it's about public health, it's about making sure the technologies are there, it's about reaching people in all parts of the world, it's about figuring out how to manage people to get something done. So if I look back in my career, that those have been my drivers. How do we make people's lives better? And I hope that when I die, um, people will say, well, you know, my life was made a tiny bit better because, you know, something that, that I, I had done or I had contributed to. The, the first thing is people. Never, ever, ever forget that you never do anything alone. Never. So you have to surround yourself with people that have the same fire in the belly that you do. When you make decisions, um, I, you know, you can make decisions with your mind and do the checklist. I want to, you know, it's good because this, this, or that. Or you make decisions with your heart, it's good. But I make decisions with my belly. Whatever even though people will say, oh my God, you're never going to develop a TB drug, which they said many times, I didn't care because I knew it was the right thing for me at the time. So make sure you surround yourself with good people. Do what makes you really want to get up in the morning and, and change the world. Get, listen, make sure you listen. A lot of people talk and they say they listen, but they really filter what people are telling them through their own prison. Put yourself in the position of the other person and listen to what they are really telling you. Because when you do that, you're able to craft a path forward. Is you're simply hearing what they're saying, but not hearing what they are really meaning, it's, um, it, it, it's a problem because then you can't reach agreement. And I guess the, 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 the final thing that, that I will say is um, work hard and be good at what you do. Nothing, no whining, nothing substitutes for hard work. So I wish I could tell you that there's a magic wand that you are, we're going to be able to swing. It is, it's day to day, it's moment to moment, it's decision after decision. But if you respect people and you care for what you do, um, I think you're going to be okay. And don't worry too much about it because I don't know what I want to do when I grow up. So why should they? <laughs> so it's, uh, it's fun. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much. Dr. Maria Freire, President and Executive Director of the Foundation for the National Institutes of Health. Thank you so much for spending this hour with us. Thank you. Thank you for sharing not just your personal story, your insights, but also uh, enlightening us on, on some of the technical challenges, some of the really exciting um, projects that are out there. I think the deeper I look at these issues, the more exciting projects I see that, 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 that young leaders um, need to sink their teeth into. Um, 
This was um, the third in our series of Meet the Leaders um, organized by the, the STG Academy of the Sustainable Development Solutions Network. Um, we'll be taking uh, a few weeks off like most people and in January we'll be back with our next um, series which will feature Paul Pullman. Paul Pullman is the CEO, the Chief Executive Officer of Unilever, uh, one of the world's largest um, food companies and also another major uh, leader on sustainable development. Um, and we'll be discussing with him in particular the questions of how uh, private sector can help advance some of these issues. And that would also be an opportunity to ask some of the climate change related questions. I apologize, I wasn't able to answer them. There were just too many, too many good questions that we had for Maria. Um, let me also take this opportunity to once again thank our wonderful partners, the UN System Staff College for their partnership and support. We work not just on this series, but, but on many, many other uh, projects together. It's a real delight. Um, and I thank the team for organizing this and, and above all, Maria, thank you again for your time um, your, and, your, and your partnership in this. And we look forward to, to continuing to work with you in the future. Thank you very much and thank you all for your questions. And if you have any, just shoot them over email and we'll try to, to answer them as well as we can. Thank you, Guido. Thank you, Guido. That's a wonderful offer. So if people would like to get in touch with Dr. Ferry, please write to us and we'll, we'll, we'll relay that information. Thank you very much and I wish you um, a good end of the day, a good uh, beginning of the day, depending on where you are. Thank you and bye-bye. Bye-bye.